see. I, you know, I think that really needs to have. Here, let's let's see if we can. This is the here. sort of thing you might expect to find going on at the Eugene Field House and St. Louis Toy Museum. A new exhibit on teddy bears. This is, after all, known for two things. It's the boyhood home of the children's poet Eugene Field, whose poems include Wink and Blink and a Nod and Little Boy Blue, and its extensive collection of antique toys. But this story is actually about what you might not expect to find at this landmark. The house is on the National Register of Historic Places because of Eugene Field. But in a new effort to get it recognized as a National Historic Site, Eugene is a footnote. The folks who run this place think it's time St. Louis start thinking of this as Eugene Field's father's house. You wouldn't normally associate the home of the man known as the children's poet with Black History Month, but on a February afternoon, people began to crowd into the old parlor for an event about some other famous St. Louisans, Dred and Harriet Scott. We are delighted to be hosting this reading of the new slave novel, Speak Right On. I'm Wendy Dyer, and I'm the interim director of this place. Many of you may not know that Roswell Field uh, came into the Dress Scott case at a pivotal point and actually instituted it to be a federal case. Wendy Dyer and, and other people associated with the Eugene case Field case House and Toy Museum have a and, bit of a problem, a challenge really. They oversee the operation of what even they consider to be one of the most frequently bypassed landmarks in the city of St. Louis. Now we're heading upstairs where the bedroom, master bedroom, and Roswell's library. Right. This is a really old house. Some of the toys, but then the rest It was once one of a row of 12 two and three story homes on South Broadway called Walsh's Row, seen in this depiction from the rear in the 1870s. But when they were built in 1845, they were away from the crowded city center. Roswell Field moved his family here in 1850, the year after the big fire and the cholera epidemic. So they moved here to escape the, the perils of city life, and it was that year that, that Eugene was born. And it was actually designed, these were rental units, it was designed for affluent businessmen, a lot of attorneys, other professional level people. Roswell Field had come to St. Louis from New England in 1839, a lawyer, a book lover, a learned man, Latin, Greek, Spanish, and a few other languages. His early law work in St. Louis involved settling claims involving old Spanish land grants. Now this is um, Roswell's library where he worked on portions of the Dred Scott case. And what we'd like to do here is make um, like a, a living Dred Scott case um, with a chronology from when Roswell took over and then taking it through the so U.S. Supreme Court. Dyer thinks there's an obvious tie-in here with the definitely, old courthouse just up the street to... where Dred and Harriet Scott sued for their freedom and won the case because they had lived in free territory. But they lost in the Missouri Supreme Court and the case was dead until Roswell Field stepped in. We have Roswell's writings that said this is the most vexing problem in the nation that's got to be heard by the highest court in the nation. He knew exactly what he was doing. Of course, the case the Scots won in the old courthouse in St. Louis, they lost in the U.S. Supreme Court in a decision that deeply divided the country and helped set the stage for the Civil War. When Roswell Field died in 1869, the newspaper reported the passing of a prominent citizen but not a history maker. It was his son Eugene who would become famous nationally and internationally for his poetry and without him the house would not be around today. Eugene Field only lived here as a small child. His mother died when he was six years old and his father sent him and his brother to live with relatives in New England. After going to college in Illinois and Missouri he started working for newspapers in St. Louis, St. Joseph, Kansas City and Denver. He was a columnist for the Chicago Daily News when he started publishing his poems. He also wrote some bawdy verse, limericks and such, and books. But it was his children's poems that made him a legitimate literary figure. When he died at just age 45, he was known as the children's poet. And seven years later, in 1902, Mark Twain unveiled a plaque marking 634 South Broadway as the birthplace of Eugene Field. By the 20th century, the wealthy had long moved away from Walsh's Row, and in coming years it would sit in the midst of factories, parking lots, and filling stations. 
and when it was announced that the whole block was going to be torn down, there was a successful campaign to save the second-to-last row house. And donations of pennies from school children helped turn it into a museum. Pieces of furniture from Eugene Fields' house in Chicago were brought down, but more importantly, the family donated Fields' extensive collection of toys, making this place what it pretty much remains today, a restored house and toy museum. And it has stood on South Broadway alone and sometimes even a little lonely ever since. In post-war St. Louis, the southern edge of downtown was in decline, slated for urban renewal. Nearby buildings would be torn down, highways came through, and a baseball stadium and an arch would be built nearby. But the restored house and toy museum stayed pretty much what it was in the 1930s. There have been ideas over the years, but there's just never been enough space to do anything. But like a lot of things around here, that too is about to change. Just pull it too. I mean, really, at this point, the location becomes a whole lot more significant. Right. I mean, that's, yes. that's got to be something you're looking at. <laughs> sure. Well, Museum board chairman Bill Piper did not come out to show me the new ballpark down the street. He came to show me the empty lot next door. After years of trying to make a deal, the museum was finally able to buy the land. What we hope to do is build an additional area that will be less the historic structure and more the hands-on type museum uh, educational facility. A physical expansion would allow a thematic expansion. They could keep wink and blink and nod, but they could add Dredd and Harriet and Roswell. We, w we don't want to lose the character of what we have, but when you look at the overall historical significance of this site, you can make an awfully good argument that it's really much more because of Roswell that it is a historic place of historic significance than because of Eugene, at least in this time. One idea they're pretty serious about is bringing back a bit more of Walsh's Row. They could put the expanded museum into a new building right next door that would look like two more row houses. For me too, she asked. The physical expansion you won't come in time for the 150th anniversary of the Dred Scott decision in 2007. But the museum is already redefining its public image and placing greater emphasis on Roswell Field. There's even been some talk about changing the name of this place to the Field Family Home. But Eugene isn't going away. He is not just another dead poet. His work is still being published with new illustrations. And there are no plans here to put away his toys. Absolutely not. No, we want people to come. And in fact, the next um, um, exhibits that we'll have that will surround toys, we are going to have hands-on opportunities for children because we know that that's what brings in the children. They love to touch things. And when we're dealing with you know, these ancient items, these wonderful, very valuable antiques, of course, there's not a lot of touching that's allowed. So right. what we're going to do is transform ourselves from a house museum into more of a, a, a hands-on thing so it can be enjoyed by a greater variety of people. But we're bursting at the seams. As you see, we're only so wide and we are dying to expand out. <laughs>